this is a cold case true crime murder mystery so if you're commenting or sharing please bear that in mind and use the appropriate sensitivity so without further ado let's get on with the story born on the 16th of december 1957 jesse earl was described as strong and independent she was studying art at eastbourne college of art and design and she really enjoyed being around nature just genuinely loved nature she particularly liked to write about it she loved walking on the sussex coast and her favorite place to walk was beachy head now for those of you that don't know beachy head is the highest chalk cliff in britain it's an absolutely beautiful place there should be some pictures on now uh, for you listening on the podcast just trust it is just beautiful white cliffs and because jesse enjoyed nature and she enjoyed the area of beachy head she quite often just go there and sit and read on wednesday the 15th of may 1980 obviously mobile phones weren't that much of a big thing so jesse used a phone box on the seafront of eastbourne to phone her mom and tell her that she'd see her two days later on the friday but she never arrived on that friday and her parents obviously jesse's 22 at this time and her parents thought she's probably changed her mind and although she does contact us to tell her when she's not coming she might have just forgot she got too busy or whatever else on the next day saturday the 16th of may jesse's mom valerie caught the train to eastbourne and she just wanted to go and see if everything were right to see if jesse were okay and probably spend some time with her but when she got there she went up to jesse's bed seat she opened the door and there was just something not quite right jesse weren't there and the entire there was just something not quite sitting right with valerie there were dirty dishes on the table Jesse's reading book on the floor, a purse on the bed. It just sent like that she just popped out for a minute. She hadn't gone to the shop because of purse on the bed. She hadn't really gone for a walk or she hadn't gone out for a day because of book on the floor. There were dirty dishes on the table. So it, everything sent like she just popped out for a minute or so and not come back. So now Jesse's mum's a little bit concerned. Obviously, there's no major alarm bells ringing. But it's not quite sitting with her. She hadn't heard of her and she was supposed to have turned up yesterday. Things just weren't right, so Jesse's mom wanted to make sure. So obviously the first thing she did was contact some of Jesse's friends. And they revealed that they hadn't heard of her since that Wednesday either. And Jesse was also an avid diary writer. She constantly wrote a diary of what she was gonna do, what she's done, how she was feeling, and there was nothing in the diary that led to any clues or any new information on where she might be or why she didn't turn up on that friday there were absolutely nothing so obviously at this point jesse's parents contact the police and say look his daughter's missing she's been gone for well over 24 hours possibly since wednesday she's missing police sniffer dogs search the area a bed sit was searched for clues and missing persons posters were distributed around the area and, and i did read something that were, i thought were quite heart grabbing jesse's mom later said when they were going through her things i thought oh god if she walks in now she'll kill me and i just thought that was quite a sweet little thing for jesse's mom to say you know it, it is that worried moment of thinking do you know what she's going to turn up in a minute she's going to see all these police searching the bed seat, making a right mess and and i'm going to be in right bother three weeks after jesse's disappearance sussex police flew a helicopter over south downs now south downs is the greater area surrounding beachhead basically and they, they did this with a thermal scanner just in hopes that something would come up maybe she was laying in a bush or i don't know maybe she was under the sand they were just looking for any sign of hope but there was no hope nothing came out of this and after that the police scaled the investigation down however jesse's parents obviously weren't willing to give up they continued to make appeals on the campaign. They went on to BBC's Wogan chat show and they even went on Crime Watch to appeal for information. At some point in 1980, the year that Jesse had gone missing, a police report was filed by DS Miller and she concluded that Jesse had committed suicide. He is not word for word, but he is pretty much what she wrote. Miss Earl was facing pressure from her studies and exams, was an introvert with not many friends, had to endure allergies all her life, and lived a life apart from others. So D.S. Miller seems to, and it, it is as you'll see later, she seems to have pulled this information, clutching at straws, to kind of depict that, oh well, you know, Jessie was, weren't doing too well in life, and she's, she, we can't find her, she's committed suicide somewhere, and we don't know where she is. Meanwhile, Jessie's mum and dad never stopped hoping. 
they just expect it to be all right. As you do, I mean, even when you find out somebody's passed away, you still, when the phone rings, think, oh, it might be them or something. And this is exactly what Jesse's mum and dad did. And they did even say that as well, that they never really stopped expecting her to be the one phoning every time the phone rang. In an interview, Jesse's dad said, we had it in our mind that it was always a possibility, a remote possibility that she could turn up. In 1989, nine years after Jessie had disappeared, an eight-year-old girl was flying a kite on Beachy Head and she lost control. It got caught in some overgrown thicket on Beachy Head, so her dad went in to rescue it. As he waded through this dense shrubland, he came across a skeleton. Obviously, this news broke out onto the radio and Jessie's mum and dad were sat listening to it and Jessie's mum phoned in and said, is it Jessie, have you got any information? Is it my Jesse? However, the person on the phone, the police officer, said, no, we don't think so. It's probably a male and absolutely nothing to do with the case. So the next day, Jesse's mom and dad went to Paris as they'd originally planned on holiday. On their first morning in Paris, they were sat eating breakfast when somebody at the hotel came over and said, here, this is for you, it's for police. Jesse's mom and dad took the phone and they received the information that the skeleton was indeed Jessie's. She'd been identified by dental records. When it was found, the skeleton was completely naked. The only, the only piece of clothing at the scene was a bra, and the bra had been knotted and tied around Jessie's wrists. Even her silver ring, watch, leather bag, and asthma inhaler were completely missing, nowhere to be found. With there only being a skeleton, forensics were unable to give any information about what had happened, the only thing that they could conclude was that Jesse had died at the scene that the skeleton was found. They couldn't determine anything else, not even the cause of death. Officers then cleared a 20 square metre perimeter and they began looking for evidence and they even excavated looking for anything that could be useful. A volunteer team of metal detectors led by an archaeologist searched for cliffs for finding items and they did find items, they found jewellery, belt buckles, but they didn't find anything that was Jesse's, and they found nothing that could help the investigation. Two and a half weeks later, the outside inquiry team was reduced down to just two officers, and then a week later, even they were stood down. On the 4th of May, the incident room was closed, and that had only been opened one month before, and still at this point, Jesse's case was not classed as a murder. Four months after Jesse's body had been discovered, a coroner recorded an open verdict at the inquest. The reason put for the reason it was an open verdict was that there weren't enough evidence to suggest what the cause of death might have been. However, Jesse's parents insisted that she would have never run off and she must have been killed. In the year 2000, after forensic inquiries, scene inquiries, witness inquiries, pathology inquiries, the police finally recorded Jesse's death as a murder. That was 20 years after she disappeared and 11 years after her body had been found in the form of a skeleton. So now a murder investigation was launched with the detective chief inspector leading the investigation. However, because Jesse's death had never officially been classed as a murder, in 1997, police destroyed potentially everything that could have been linked for forensic evidence. This included the bra, and police had also stored the ground which she was found on, or the earth, because that might have had forensic information. But even that, and even the bra, was now gone. The police had got rid of it in 1997. So unlike all the other cold cases we look at, where there's still a glimmer of hope that modern forensic technology, DNA technology, will be able to lead to some sort of evidence, that's not a possibility here. There is no glimmer of hope that advancing DNA technologies will be able to find a killer, because it would all been thrown away and got rid of. And the lead investigator of the 2000 inquirer, DCI Steve Dennis, he, he also said that that was a significant mistake, and I don't think you can rule that out. That was a major, major mistake. However, a new suspect did emerge in the late 2000s. It was sex offender and serial killer Peter Tobin. Please do bear with us because we're about to go down a massive rabbit hole. Tobin had killed 23-year-old Angelica Cluck in Glasgow in 2006. But it was then subsequently linked to two missing persons from 1991. And that was purely because police suspected that he'd be responsible for other murders. 
The two young women were found buried in his former home in Margate, which is 80 miles away from where Jesse had been found. Now, although that sounds like a long way, please bear with us, because this is a really good link. After the 2006 murder, police set up Operation Anagram. And Operation Anagram's entire point and purpose was to trace Tobin's past movements and investigate whether he could have been linked to any other murders or m missing persons. And the case of Jesse Earl was one of the main cases that Operation Anagram focused on. At the time of Jesse Earl's murder, Peter Tobin did live in that area. And to make things even worse, Jesse did quite perfectly fit the type of person that Tobin targeted. Further on from that, Jessie had previously told her mom that she was nervous about a man that she'd met while she was out walking. This man had been described as middle-aged and Scottish, and she had met him in the area that her body had been found. One of the last conversations Jessie had with her mom was about meeting this man at Beachyhead, and she also commented, I wish men would be prepared to be just friends. Shortly after it became public knowledge that Jessie Hill's body had been found in 1989, Peter Tobin very quickly got his wife and child and moved to Scotland. Now, let me just put that into context. I don't mean that it was coincidence and they were in a rush to move. I mean, shortly after it became public knowledge, Peter Tobin went home to his wife and said, look, we have to move. We're moving up to Scotland. We're moving now. So he moved to Bathgate in Scotland. And I just want to put that into context as well, because Eastbourne is on the southern coast of England. And he went all the way up through England, past the rest of England, into Scotland. This is about 108, 580 miles. He nearly went 600 miles away. Now, you could say that is just a coincidence. But Peter Tobin has quite a habit of moving across the entire country after he's murdered. For example, in 1991, a couple of years after that he'd moved to Bathgate, he then murdered 15-year-old Vic Hamilton. So then he went home. He got his wife and child and moved from Bathgate all the way down to Margate. Now, if you remember earlier on, I said Margate was 50 miles away from, 80 miles away, sorry, from Eastbourne. So he'd come, he'd, this body had been found at Jesse Earls. He'd then moved 500 miles up north. Then he killed Vicky Hamilton and then he moved pretty much all the way back down. It's probably 500 mile by road again, but it's ever so slightly more north and more to the west. So it does seem like it might have been something it have done. The body's been found, we need to move, we need to avoid being caught. There is another very important piece of information. If you remember back, Jessie had her hands tied together with a bra. That is also the same thing that happened to Vic Hamilton. In Mark Williams Thomas's book, Hunting Killers, he did notice that Tobin usually buried his victims. And although Jesse weren't buried, if there were another link that pretty much all of Tobin's victims were opportunistic killings and that is what it seemed to be with Jesse. An example of that is in 1994 he trapped two neighbouring 14 year old girls in his flat before turning on the gas pipes and leaving them for dead. This indicates that he could have, he weren't very organised in his crimes, he was very disorganised, there were random attacks, 100% opportunistic and this is what he could have done to Jesse. Especially if he was the Scotsman that she described on previous walks. It could have been there again and used that opportunity to kill her. Because they disregarded all of Jesse's items, they had nothing to test for DNA. So as a part of Operation Anagram, police took DNA samples from Jesse's mom and Jesse's dad. And then they went to Peter Tobin's house, got his belongings, got his clothes and tried to find the DNA match that way. Obviously that's not as easy and it's a lot harder to find a DNA match and nothing came out of it. A DNA link between Tobin and Jesse's body could not be found. It just weren't possible and obviously it is speculated that that is purely because all of the evidence had been thrown away. A lot of people do believe and I'm not going to lie, so do I, that if that DNA evidence hadn't been thrown away we could have got something from that. Apparently linked to Jesse's murder is a similar case that Operation Anagram looked into and that was the disappearance of 18 year old Louise Kay. She was also from the same town, Eastbourne, and in 1988 she disappeared. And there was a lot of similarities. Not only was there both young women from Eastbourne, but Kay's last known location was at Beachy Head. And again, that's where Jesse's 
remains are found. Kay had been out with her friends that evening and she dropped a friend off and said she was going to go and park a car on Beachyhead and sleep in a car. This was something she did quite often and ever since then she was never seen. And up to this day the body's never been found. And yes, Operation Anagram did find that Peter Tobin was still in the area at that time. So if you're like me you'll be thinking, well what happened to a car? Surely th this is something or nothing. But Kay's car was a distinctive Ford Fiesta. It was gold with a white door. And that also disappeared. But under Operation Anagram, police did find out that at the time of Kay going missing, Peter Tobin was selling a hand-painted small car. Similar to Jessa, Kay had met an unknown Scottish man in Eastbourne a few days before she vanished, and he'd given her some money for petrol. If you remember, some of Peter Tobin's previous victims had been found in his gardens. So police did search his Brighton home in 2010, hoping that Kay would be found buried in that garden, but she weren't. Operation Anagram's lead officer, Detective Superintendent David Swindle, told Williams Thomas in 2018, the investigator documentary, that he believes Tobin was Kay's murderer. But going back to Jesse Hill's story, in 2018, Sussex police stated that they had no evidence implicating Tobin or any other named or known individual in Jesse's murder. At this point, the case was once again cold. They had no lines of inquiry, and they were reviewing the case every two years, but obviously they had no lines of inquiry. Jesse's parents did believe that Peter Tobin could have been responsible for Jesse's murder. In June 2020, Jesse Hill's parents asked the Attorney General to open a new inquest. They said that Jesse's body had been found naked, so they'd always really known it had been a murder. The RT on Michael Ellis, QCMP, said, I have concluded the initial investigation was insufficient, and further lines of inquiry should have been pursued. It is in the interest of justice the application for a new inquest be heard by the High Court. In December 2021, the request for a new inquest was approved by the High Court. The second inquest into Jesse Hill's murder was opened in May 2022. It formally concluded that her death was a result of unlawful killing by murder. The hearing heard that she'd probably been tied to a tree and possibly sexually assaulted. An officer that was involved in the initial investigation testified that she never really had a doubt that Jesse had been murdered. And the coroner, James Healy Pratt, had a major role in this new inquest. He criticised an original police investigation and highlighted a number of flaws. He said, with Miss Earl's journal being a fairly reliable personal account of an intelligent, well-balanced young woman enjoying almost every moment of her life, curiously, there is no evidence to support these reasons that were given to support suicide as the most likely outcome. Neither has there been any explanation why the report made a conclusion that was seemingly dissonant with available evidence. He also said that these assumptions would have led to less resources being expended on a missing persons case. Instead, in other words, it would have been a chilling effect on police efforts to investigate the disappearance of Jesse. He concluded that the report treating her death as a suicide was wrong and contrary to evidence. He then went on to highlight one of the conversations that Jesse had with her mother in 1980, in which Jesse described meeting a middle-aged man during one of her regular walks at Beachy Head. The one which she told her mother, I wish men would be prepared to just be friends. Concluding, it said Jesse's parents had been the victims of substantial injustice, and as, as a result, the Earl family suffered a great deal of distress during the nine years until her body was found. Sussex Police's Chief Constable Joe Shiner responded to the results of a new inquest by stating she fully accepted the historic failures of Sussex Police in this case, and accepting the police investigations in 1980 and 1989 were inadequate, with some aspects wholly inadequate. She commented saying the investigation into the case remained open, and she was committed to ensuring new lines of inquiry were effectively investigated. In 2022, police gathered DNA from Jesse's parents once again. They checked this against trophies and other evidence collected from David Fuller. David Fuller was a double murderer who had been recently convicted of killing two women in Tunbridge Wells in 1987. Tunbridge Wells is about 30 miles away from where Jesse's body had been found. However, no links were found. After the 2022 inquest, Jesse's parents, who were now in the 90s, were asked how they were feeling about the ruling. 
Jesse's mom said, elated, definitely very pleased. Her dad then followed up, yes, slightly exhausted. It's a terrific statement from the coroner that's covered every single point that we've been worrying about for the last 30 odd years. Every single point, he's left nothing behind, he's cleared absolutely everything that was in our minds. When asked about the future, Jesse's mom said, it must be closure. I can't help feeling that this is not the end. But then in regards to the conclusion of the inquest, she said it can go into the family folder and our grandchildren will be able to see what happened to their aunt. I think this is probably as far as it will go unless somebody comes up. I think the last three days has probably been as much as we can cope with. Whoever it is, there is somebody still out there. Jesse Earle's remains are buried in a child's coffin in Eltham Cemetery. A tragically shortened life is marked with a small plaque inscribed with three dates. It reads, Jesse Victoria Earle. Born 16th of December 1957, died May 1980, interred 7th of July 2000. That's all the information I have for you. And I don't want to sound like I'm anti-police, because I'm really not. Uh, they do conclude a lot of cases, and I certainly couldn't do that job, especially when you're looking for people that are missing or people that have been murdered. But if you look back at the cold cases I've done, they all result in if the police had, or major mistakes that the police have made. Now, I know in hindsight that's so much easier to say, but, I mean, this case in particular, if if she'd committed suicide, surely she'd have been at the bottom of the cliff, or she'd have been hung, or she'd have been in a flat. The fact that she was just completely missing says to me you can't write it off as suicide. You can't hide your body after you've killed yourself. And then it strikes me even more... But even after she'd been found with what looks like a wrist had been tied together with a bra, how on earth was that not then changed into a murder inquiry straight away? Because let's not forget that although a body was found in 1989, a skeleton or a body had a bra wrapped around her wrists. She was completely naked. That to me doesn't sound like suicide. But at that point, this still didn't change the case from a missing person or suicide to murder. They just kept it as it were. So then moving later on into the 90s, into the late 90s, all that stuff, a bra and the soil that could have had crucial evidence were then thrown away. So why, who was responsible for it not being changed then? Because if at any point it should have been changed into a murder case, it should have been then. And again, I'm not picking fault at the police. Like I said, I don't do the job. It's easier in hindsight. But I do think that that was more than just a mistake. That was a major cock-up of whoever decided that that didn't need to be changing there and then. Or maybe it weren't decided. It was just overlooked and nobody changed it. But in, in my opinion, that bra could have had Peter Tobin's DNA on it. Or somebody else's DNA on it. And therefore it could have been found that that person murdered her. But that information will never be found because apparently a skeleton being found with its wrist tied together by a bra isn't enough to say somebody were murdered. And furthermore, I'd understand going out of bodies naked, that's expected because she left all her clothes on a bedsit floor, but she weren't. So you, you, I just don't understand how these mistakes were made. And I think... I, I, I promise I haven't tried to make it look like Peter Tobin was a person. Maybe the media has. Um, and obviously that's where I get a lot of my information from. Although I do look try to look as deep as possible for as much information as possible. But from everything that I could find, it does massively suggest that Peter Tobin did it. Unfortunately, unless he confesses to it, there's never ever going to be enough evidence to say he did it. Because... We haven't got any DNA forensic evidence. It's just gone. And it is such a shame. It really is. And I don't think that's very fair on Jesse's parents. Who, like I said, now in the 90s and still having to go to inquests and things about this. It is absolutely ridiculous. Um, that's it. That's it. That's all I've got for this show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. I hope it was educational. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. If you did, please press subscribe. If you are subscribed, please do share it. And please do put the thumbs up. It does all help a lot. 
I haven't seen any contact information for anyone that does have information. But if I find any, it will be in the description down below. So if you do think you've got any information, please check down there. Until next week, guys. Thank you.